Hey everybody, welcome back to another fantastic edition of the His and Her Money Show, where we make it our business to help you take dominion over your money and your life. Thank you so much for tuning in once again, because you don't have to. The fact that you're here rocking with His and Her Money, we want you to know that we are grateful and appreciative of your presence. Do us a favor, if you hear anything that rocks your world, make sure that you share it with your world and let folks know that they need to tune in to the show as well because you're going to love today's episode. You know, we love to help you on this journey with your finances because it's important. It affects every area of your life. And so that's why for the last 10 years, we've been trying to give you as much help as possible. And this episode is going to continue on that journey. We have a very special guest for today's episode. His name is George Kemmel. He's part of the Dave Ramsey personality groups, and he's been rocking for years, helping people just like you get better with their money. And he's about to do that again today. So like we always tell you, get your pen and paper ready, get your notes app open, because we don't want you to miss not one nugget that George is going to drop on this episode. We don't do this for entertainment. We do this to equip you to do the work. So get ready because we're going to go get George so he can share all of his story and his wisdom with us today. Hey, George, welcome to the His and Her Money Show. It's such an honor to be here. I feel like I'm inside of the Matrix right now, getting to see your show. I've been a fan for a long time. I know my friend Jade Warshaw was on recently, and I'm honored to to follow her up. That's a bit a tall order, but I'm here for it. Well, we're glad that you're here, man. Um, your story and your journey personally and even professionally has been inspiring to Ty and I and to a whole lot of people around the world. But there are a couple people tuned in right now who are being introduced to you for the very first time. Would you mind saying hello to them and then just kind of let them know what you're all about? Absolutely. Well, first of all, hello to all of you. Uh, I've been on the Ramsey team now for a decade, which is wild. I started as an, an intern in social media and email, and I never thought I was going to be out front in front of the camera. One of my goals was I was going to be a filmmaker or something when I was in high school, and I didn't know I'd be on the other side because I don't have a face for camera, to be honest. You got it. But, you know, this is what the Lord had for me. And uh, over 10 years of working at Ramsey, I followed the principles because when I started here, I was just the average George. I was $40,000 in consumer debt, my student loans, my credit cards. I had followed the path that I was told to follow, right? Get good grades, you know, do well in school, go to the college of your dreams, get the degree. And I didn't know that all that monopoly money would come back to haunt you later in life. And I would be cynical toward adulthood at 23 years old going, is this it? Because I'm broke out here. And they told me to do all this stuff and I'd have a great life. And I had immigrant parents. And so they worked hard to provide for us to give us a better life than they had, you know, moving from the Middle East. And here I was going, this American dream delivered me the American nightmare. And so I had to make some changes. And so luckily I ran into the Ramsey plan, got out of that consumer debt years ago, met my wife here at Ramsey. She was on board. We started off our marriage debt free. We bought a house with no credit score. We did some weird things. We paid it off early in our 30s, went from broke to millionaire in a decade. And now I'm just shouting from the rooftops. Y'all, if I can do it, anyone can. Yeah, man. Let's go back to the beginning because you just brought up a, a heck of a point. Your parents were immigrants and you said that they worked really hard to position you to be able to excel here in America. And you followed the script you, you to a T, good grades, good school, good job. And then in your early 20s, you're like, wait, this didn't work like I thought it would work. Talk about the emotions right there, because... For you to go through that process, that means your parents worked hard to position you, but you had to work hard to use the launch pad that they gave you to go further. So you put in a lot of work in school. You put in a lot of work to get the job. And then you have this moment of epiphany like, wait a minute, this, this ain't a dream. This is a nightmare. What did you do with the emotions in that moment? Oh, man. Well, you know, you're so excited. You're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in high school, right? The world is your oyster. You can do anything you want, any degree, and that means you can also make any stupid decisions you want to make. And so I was about this close to going $200,000 into debt for a film degree, and even before I knew Dave, I went, I don't know that that's going to work out for me. I'm not that talented. And so, you know, there was decisions where you go, you're excited, but money was an obstacle. And for so long, that's how I saw money. It was it was this kind of like 
negative emotion. Uh, I saw a video recently where this woman said, I don't look at my bank account because I don't need that negative energy in my life. And I went, that's how most of us felt. I remember feeling that way where you just try to not look and it was sort of this fingers crossed mentality about money. And as long as you didn't look, somehow everything was going to be okay. And until I actually uh, chose reality, as my friend Dr. Don John Deloney would say, I had to go, okay, I make $37,000 a year and I'm $40,000 in debt. You don't have to be a math prodigy to know this is a bad situation. And so that's when I had to start going, I can stay cynical, right? That's an option. We can just stay anxious and stressed out and angry and frustrated and you know, vent on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok reels about how terrible everything is. Or I can choose hope and go, I'm going to fight this thing. I'm going to beat Goliath and I'm going to get on the other side of this and break free from this system. And that's one of the reasons I wrote my new book, Breaking Free from Broke. You have to understand how the system is out to get you and how our parents and guidance counselors and the credit card companies, they're all complicit. You know, some of them well-meaning, some of them malicious, but they're all complicit in guiding all of these, you know, younger generations down this path that have led us to this frustration that we feel today. What was the moment? Because you're on the American Dream conveyor belt. You did all the check boxes that you were supposed to. What made you what made the conveyor belt in your life stop and say, wait a minute, now this ain't it. You said that you had this moment where you realized that I make 30 something thousand and I owe 40 something thousand. So how did you even come to that point of pulling out the calculator and doing the math? Did something snap in you? Did was there an event? Talk to us about that. Oh yeah. So that was a, it was a strange event. I had identity theft occur. And so I didn't even know how much debt I had. Truthfully, like many people, you just kind of bury your head in the sand and go ballpark. I don't know. My parents took out some loans and it was a parent plus over here and a federal subsidized over here. And you just wait for mail to come in telling you, telling you, you, you owe money. And so I had identity theft happen where people opened a, a cell phone accounts in my name across the country. So I had debt collectors calling me to collect on this 1700 bucks here, 1700 bucks here. And I'm like, I don't even have a Verizon account. I don't know what you're talking about. So I pulled my credit report and that was the first time I saw all of my debts listed out. And I had to stare at that financial mirror and I added it up and I went, I owe more than I make. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Just the minimum payments alone while trying to pay for rent and bills. I was like, I got no money at the end of the month to live my life. I thought adulthood after you graduate college is when you get to live and really enjoy stuff after you work so hard through this education system. And instead, I was sitting there going, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get out of this ever. And so that's when I went, you get that pit of the stomach, lump in the throat, a little sweat on the brow, and I was desperate. And uh, I ran into Ramsey through this internship, and I had heard about Ramsey, like, okay, he's this money guy. He's this kind of you know older boomer, financial peace stuff. All right. But my plan wasn't working. So I thought, I'll give them a shot. So through the onboarding process, I went through Financial Peace University when I started here back in 2013. And that was this paradigm shift where I was like, I got to deprogram all the things I thought I knew about money. All the things my parents had told me that were well-meaning, like, well, you got to get the credit score. And to do that, you got to get the credit card. And well, you got to have a car. I mean, everyone's got a car payment. And all of those pieces started stacking up. And I had to go, this doesn't make sense. Like when you really pan back and you go, so the system is designed to keep us broke and we're just going to stay in the system and play their game and hope we get to the cheese and win. But at the end of the day, we're just a rat in the maze. And I went, there's got to be more to life than this rat race. And so that's where financial peace was so clutch for me to change my paradigm, to give me hope, to motivate me and give me that plan. You know, when I, I was in, I was in my early twenties, I was in my career I was thriving in my career when I figured out that I blew it when it came to debt. You were starting your career. You did school and you, through this identity theft situation, realized the situation that you were in. I'm, I'm curious for me at that moment, being, quote unquote, successful in, in, in work and in, in life, but failing at money made me feel like a failure overall. And I had to do some internal work before I could do any external work, before I could get a budget, before I could uh, uh, read these books about money, before I could listen to these shows about money, like on the inside, I felt like, man, how did I, how did I blow it like that? Did you have to do any internal work that helped you 
to do the external work that you went on to do? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when it comes to that internal piece, I think I had baggage from money mistakes and I had this paradigm of how I grew up. You know, my parents, they kind of define your financial destiny. A lot of us think like, well, we grow up in this kind of economic climate. This is kind of how we're going to be. You either born into money or you're just going to stay struggling for the rest of your life. So that was kind of in my head, in the back of my mind. I just went, well, we're not we're not rich people. We're never going to be rich people. And I just got to settle into that life and go, all right, well, I'm just got to figure out how to manage my payments, get really good at debt management instead of money management, because that's not on the cards for me. And so, so many people, as I take calls on the Ramsey show, there's so much stress and guilt and shame and baggage and hurt and relationships in the past where there was financial abuse or financial infidelity, or they saw their parents fight about money. And so that's a piece of the puzzle that you know, I had to grapple with to go, what were the pieces in my past that I had to go? Those are, that's a lie. I'll never, it's not, it's not, I'll always be bad with money. That's not my identity. And so I had to go, my mistakes don't define me, but they will refine me if I can learn from them and go, that hurt. That mistake I made over there, that debt I took out, that fraud that happened, man, I feel like a failure, but that's not who I am and that's not where I'm headed. And so to, you know, we, we say the windshield's bigger for a reason than the rearview mirror. Because we got to focus on where we're headed, or else we're going to get a crick in our neck and crash. We always stare back at the past. But man, it's such a freeing feeling when you start to see the progress, when you start building for the future instead of paying for the past. And that's where those baby steps gave me that hope because it's that little win, little win. You can do this. You're changing your family tree. And over time, you go, my identity's changing in the process. What happened next? You had this identity theft problem. You that turns you to dig into your finances. You realize how much debt you're in. You work through the internal feelings that you're having around this revelation. What'd you do next? Well, the first thing I did was go, I got to make more money. And I knew I couldn't just double my salary, you know, overnight through my full time job. And so, you know, I had that side hustle mentality and I went to work. And on top of that, you know, there's only two ways to create that more more margin in your life to pay off debt or accomplish your financial goals. You got to spend less and you got to make more. And so I found all the ways I could spend less. I started, I stopped eating out. I would wait for lean cuisines to go on sale at the grocery store, five for $10. So it was $2 a meal and I was doing the math. I was like, all right, if I can live out, that's $4 a day. That's 120 bucks a month. I can. And so I started crunching all these numbers and then you get addicted to it. And I'm starting to coupon. I'm starting to go, you know what? I don't need to go out with friends. They can come over to my house. They can bring some pizza. We'll call that good. And then I started going, what are all the side hustles I can do from the skills and talents that I have to things that anyone can do? So I started driving for Uber and Lyft. And I started doing the Nielsen people meter. It's a little beeper you carry around and it listens to the radio and TV you're listening to. And I'd make 20 bucks a month from that. And I, that's a win right there. Then I started freelancing, doing marketing, consulting, building websites for, you know, authors and entrepreneurs and all of that added up it nearly doubled my income that year because i was just every night i come home from work i'd get back to work and you know when you're young and you're single that is the time to do this so if you're listening and that's you uh now's the time don't have the yolo mentality have like what can i do now before i got obligations and big bills to pay and family to take care of that's when things shift and it becomes harder to do that when you've got three kids and a spouse at home and so all of that combined uh, using the debt snowball method, listing all my debts, smallest to largest, knocked out my credit card. Then I had, you know, the 11 different student loans, and I started listing them out, smallest to largest, attacking them with a vengeance. And over time, 18 months later, I was completely out of this consumer debt and debt free. And it was an amazing feeling. So I know probably a pressing question out there for everybody listening is, what was your go-to link cuisine meal? Hmm? Oh, man. You know, they had like this like Thai style beef that made me feel it was elevated. It was, I was like, wow, this is this is where the cuisine comes in. And, you know, the lean part, I had that down. And it's part of the reason I, stay, I stayed so thin. Now, I don't even know if I can look at a lean cuisine again. You know, I, have, I got PTSD from all those lean cuisine. They were sta if you open my freezer, it was sad. It looked like I, there was a lean cuisine apocalypse and only I knew about it. And I was stocking up, man. Well, you're not alone. For me, it was Hot Pockets. Oh. That was always hit. <laughs> so, okay, you were hustling hard 18 months straight. What kind of conversations did you have with like family and friends? Because clearly what you were doing 
hindered you from probably going here, there and being a part of this and being a part of that? Did you like articulate this to your circle? What was the feedback? Like, how did you handle the social aspects, social sacrifices you were making during this journey? Yeah, I mean, there was some hard conversations and some friends didn't really understand. And luckily, you know, working at Ramsey, my friends here, they're all on board. And so we're kind of in this blessed bubble of people who are cheering you on. And it's weird because we are all on this money journey. So we're talking about debt and numbers in a way that you wouldn't with friends outside of Ramsey. And so my family was cheering me on because they knew, you know, of, of the goal that I had. And so there was a lot of support on top of the weirdness of people going, I don't know, what do you mean you're, you can't go out? What do you mean you're doing, you're doing Uber and Lyft? You're doing a third side hustle right now? Come on, man. And, but all of that, I was so laser focused on my goal that it didn't really matter. It was, it was like a superpower to not care what other people thought because I knew the race I was running and I knew it was going to be worth it on the other side. And I also knew they didn't pay my bills. They didn't carry my stress. And so at the same time, it was easy to push all of the negativity aside because I was so excited about the goal and where I was headed. And I knew I could get there. Once you start to get on that plan, you see that progress. It's hard to stop. Now, you mentioned goal three times right there. How did you approach that? Was it was the goal just I want to be debt free or was it super specific? Like I'm giving myself this amount of time. Did you write it down? Like for people that are looking to walk out the journey that you're articulating and how did you approach the goal? Well, you know, a lot of people, they look at their income, they look at their debt level and it's, it's hard to figure out exactly when you're going to get there. So what helped me, you know, first of all, the baby steps lay it out perfectly where they go, all right, a thousand bucks. That's your first goal in a, in a starter emergency fund, second goal, debt snowball. And so that really helped me focus because I wasn't distracted by, well, I got to invest and I got to save up for this. It was debt payoff is a one right now. And so once, once I looked at my margin and I went, okay, through the side hustle, through my paycheck, I could have this much in margin if it all works out to where I could put, you know, a thousand bucks extra on, on my debt this month. So then it becomes easy math to go, all right, 18 months from now, 24 months from now, I should have this all paid off. And that's the average it takes for people following the baby steps to get out of debt completely on the consumer side is 18 to 24 months. So that was kind of my window, but you know, I'm, I, I'm a goal oriented person and so I was like, how do I beat that goal? So I had a two year goal and I went, can I do an extra side hustle? Can I increase my consulting rate in order to make that extra money in order to shrink down six months off of this plan? Because sacrifice is hard. And so if we can shorten the time frame you're sacrificing, it's going to be easier. I mean, my friend Jade Warshaw, they had a, almost half a million in debt and it took them seven years. And I go, that is a grind. I can't imagine doing that much for that long. But, you know, the bigger your shovel, the more it's going to help and the bigger the hole, the longer it's going to take. And so I just kept going, how do we shrink that? How do we shrink the gap and find that margin? Now you, uh, you talked about the fact that part of your motivation and part of your energy came from where you worked and the people you were around for people that are watching and listening that, you know, they work on, in a field that doesn't have anything to do with finances or getting out of debt. And they are about to embark on this journey because they're hearing your story. They, they see that it can be done. What type of motivation tips would you give them? Because on this journey, you just talked about with Jade, half a million, you 40,000. It doesn't happen overnight. And so you have to, it's easy to, to, to begin with motivation, not as easy to maintain motivation. What advice would you give to people to help them maintain the motivation they need to get to the finish line of paying off their debt? Mm -hmm. Well, number one, I'm, I'm the kind that needs a carrot kind of dangling in front of me. So I need something exciting to look forward to to celebrate, you know, the milestones. I make it visual. And the other thing I did that was interesting was I looked at my inputs. What's all the stuff that I'm consuming from podcasts to social media to the friends that I'm around? And there was some things I had to turn off. And one of those was the news, right? All the headlines and fear mongering and the economy's going to crash. Nothing's worth it. And then all of the social media reels going, hey, you know what? Don't do the debt payoff. Here's a, here's a hack to where you don't even have to pay off your debt. You can just move it to the 0% balance transfer card and you can do this 401k loan and it's tax free. And I'm going, there's so much noise out there. And so you got to turn the dials way down, turn off the noise. And sometimes that's your broke friends. Sometimes that's your family telling you that you're crazy and that there's a better way and they figured it out and they've got the hack. 
And so, so much of that was looking at my environment and my inputs and going, what, what's the ones that are actually feeding me? And what are the ones that are draining me and that are slowing me down? And that was a tough thing to do because that involves some hard conversations that involves maybe even shutting down some friendships and finding some new ones. And that's where things like the Ramsey Baby Steps community on Facebook are incredible. Joining a Financial Peace University class to where you're in a whole room of people who are aligned with those values, who are talking the same language, who have the same goals. That's the encouragement that I think people need is the accountability, especially if you're single. You need to find those people in your life who are also running towards something big that they they can help you keep you accountable when you feel like impulse spending on Black Friday. They can go, hey, what are we doing this Friday? Let's let's hang out so you're not tempted to spend. Uh, and then the other piece of it is having that goal so laser focused and having the numbers there. Too many people go, well, I want to get out of debt this year. Not a great goal. I want to get out of $40,000 in consumer debt using the debt snowball in the next 18 months. Now we got something. And so to stay motivated, I need it to be really tactical. I need it to track the goal. You know, there's Excel spreadsheets. You can do it with rings hanging in your living room and you cut the ring every time you, you pay off another thousand bucks. Whatever that is to you, put it on your bathroom mirror. You got to keep it visual and in front of your face. Otherwise, it just becomes a goal sitting in an iPhone note somewhere three years later. What's really cool about your story is you kept doing crazy stuff. You paid off your debt, the consumer debt, 18 months. You get married and you and your wife decide to be crazy together. And you decided, let's pay off our house. Let's, let's not do 30. Let's not do 15. Let's get rid of it way faster than that. Talk about that conversation and the thought that went into it and some of the intentional decisions you made up front that allowed you to make this goal a reality. Mm, yeah, I love that you mentioned that up front because there's a there's a lot of pre-deciding that happens. We had to pre-decide that we wanted a life with no debt, and that included the mortgage. And that was before we got married. We were already aligning those values. And I understand like that is a unicorn. A lot of people go, listen, my spouse isn't on board. We don't have the same exact goals and values and principles when it comes to money. But I'm telling you, if you can get there through the hard conversations, that will allow you to build wealth so much faster with so much more peace and less money fights. And that's what happened. You know, her working at Ramsey, she's already aligned. She was much smarter than me, much better with money. So she didn't have any debt going into this marriage. You know, we cash flowed the wedding. We already had our emergency fund. We were already investing 15% into our retirement. And so we went, man, we could save up like a big down payment. Let's rent for a year, you know, as we start off this marriage. But then let's get a reasonable, modest home with a big down payment, which will allow us to pay it off early. And so that's what we did. We, we got a 15-year fixed rate mortgage where the payment was no more than a quarter of our take-home pay. And with our dual income and even more, so I was still doing side hustles. I mean, I was just like, I was, at the time I was an MC and I was MCing outside events over the summer just to bring in extra money to add to this down payment fund. And so as we got into it, we did the 15 year. We had a goal. My wife said, I said, let's pay it off in four years. How cool would that be? With extra principal payments, we could pay this thing off in four years. And my wife said, now nah, we can do better. I was like, oh, shoot. OK, she just one up me here. And so she said, we're going to do it in under three years. I was like, OK, well, we'll see about that. And so now that we had that goal, now it's like, how do we beat that goal? And so that's what I love about an aggressive goal is it's exciting and you track it and you go, how do we beat last month's principal payment? And we ended up paying off that mortgage in 26 months with that focus intensity we both had. And so in our early 30s, we didn't have a mortgage payment. And the, the onus to that was we asked ourselves questions like, what could we do with no payments in our early 30s? What kind of life could we live now? What kind of legacy could we leave later? How could we give differently? What kind of fun experiences could we have? How does this change our family tree and how our kids and grandkids will experience their financial journeys? And that was it was too exciting to pass up that offer. And so we said, what's the worst that's going to happen? We're going to regret it and go back into debt? Doubt it. And so and the other side of that in our early 30s, it was an incredible feeling, uh, you know, looking around at people who are trying to retire and still pay off debt to go. We don't have that stress and anxiety as we start off our marriage. I love the fact that you said that you all decided together to rent in a strategic way, because some narratives are out there that renting is a waste of money. It can be, but it also cannot be. So 
when you all were discussing this, because it it, it just kind of comes with a young new marriage, like we're not officially a, an adulthood couple until we get a house. So let's just go get the house or the condo or the townhouse, like right out the gate. You all decided to do things differently. Talk us through that conversation and decision. Absolutely. Yeah, I have a whole chapter on mortgages in Breaking Free from Broke where I talk about this dichotomy of rent versus home buying and the blessing of home ownership, the burden of home ownership and giving people, you know, I have a lot of empathy for renters who are going, when do you want me to buy, man? The housing market's out of control. Housing housing has doubled in the past five years and I feel like I'll never be a homeowner. And, you know, renting to me is it's buying patience and there's so much wisdom in renting. Uh, there's there's so many aspects of home ownership that sound good on paper, but in reality can be really stressful. And we get the calls where it didn't work out perfectly and they bought too much house too soon. And 60 percent of their take home pay is going towards this mortgage and they don't have the emergency fund to stomach the HVAC going out or that roof repair. And all of a sudden, that idea of home ownership that was such a great idea on paper five years ago. Now they're going, do we sell the house to pay off the debt? We can't we can't live like this. And so we see the other side of it. And that's why I tell people only buy when you're ready to buy. Home ownership is a wonderful blessing, but it can be a curse if you do it too early, too soon because of all the outside pressures, which is usually your family going, well, you're wasting money on rent. What are you doing? You should buy a house. And I just I tell people, ignore all of that. That's one of those another inputs you got to turn off and you got to stay laser focused and stop caring what other people think. And uh, that's one of those things you might have to rent for five years as you save up the down payment or get out of debt. But I'd rather you buy a house peacefully, even if it's a little more expensive down the line, than get a house now that you end up having to sell because it was a mistake. Your story, the, the, the cliff notes, is that you went from broke to millionaire over a decade. You paid off consumer debt. You paid off your mortgage. And then you grew your net worth to seven figures all by your early 30s. Age aside, the journey itself is this something anybody can do? That's a great question. Can anybody become a millionaire in America today? I believe so. I still believe in even in the craziness of this economy and the housing market and inflation and the guy in the White House and the Congress can't get their, their heads together to make anything happen. I still believe it's possible for anyone to become a millionaire. Now, if you're 60 and you've made a lot of money mistakes and you've got a big pile to clean up, it's going to be a lot harder. If you're 20, you still got 40 years to undo a lot of money mistakes and create the right habits. So there's a spectrum there, right, of, you know, the pile of debt you have, the income you have, all of that matters. And for a lot of people that go, well, he did it in a decade. I don't think I can do that. That's OK. This is not a competition. Uh, if you do it in 15 years and 20 years and 25 years, that's amazing. And most of us have 20, 25 years ahead of us, uh, you know, before the good Lord takes us home. And so that's very encouraging to me that if you can still fog up a mirror, there's still hope for you to be had to have a higher net worth tomorrow and the next day. And even then, it's not really about the net worth. That's a fun milestone to achieve because so many of us, we've had the hope beaten out of us early on in our life to go. You'll never get there. No one can be a millionaire or even on the other side. Here's the other one I hear. Well, who cares? A million dollars is nothing today. That's chump change. I'm like, well, you sound like someone who doesn't have it, because to me, that's still a lot of money. And on top of that, a million dollars won't change you. You go with you. And the money's tied up in retirement and your home equity. And so it's not like you wake up one day and you just get to retire and do nothing for the rest of your life. It, it's just one of those things where when you have no debt, you have emergency savings in the bank, you've got a pile of money in your nest egg because you've been investing for the future. You just get to make different choices. You got margin. You got options. You have more peace and more joy. And the conversations move from how are we going to pay for the bills the last month to how are we going to give in the next month? What kind of vacation do we want to take this year? Where are we going to take the kids? And that's a, that's a very different conversation that I think most people, that's really what they're craving deep down is that kind of margin, just to get to live a life they're not exhausted by, to leave a legacy they're proud of. For the dreamers out there. You hit three major milestones in, by your early 30s. Consumer debt paid off. Mortgage paid off. Seven-figure net worth. For the dreamers listening and watching, can you give us a little insight to those moments? What did you feel when you got rid of the consumer debt? What was it like to make that final when you went into the bank and made that final mortgage payment? 
when you realized, hey, our net worth is over seven figures. What were the emotions there? Because a lot of people that get their energy from hearing stories um, of real people who did these real things in real life. Mm. Well, I got to say the baby step two debt payoff may be the most exciting thing because that's the moment where you stop paying for the past and start building for the future. And to me, that's still the, that's the moment we celebrate on the Ramsey show is the baby step two folks who paid off their consumer debt and the baby step six folks who paid off their house. Um, I, I think the baby step two is like it's it's that youthful glow of just, oh, my gosh, I never thought this would be possible for me. Because once you pay off your consumer debt, the house debt just becomes that's another thing. You know, now we know we can do this. The house is going to get paid off. And so you're almost more confident at that point because you've seen the progress. You've seen the results. And so while baby step six is still amazing, I got to tell you, uh, my baby step two payoff was more exciting because here's what happened in baby step six. When you go to the bank, I thought it was going to be like confetti. Like I could go online and just hit pay off mortgage and there was confetti on the website and we all celebrate. No, no, no. They go, well, you need a payoff statement. OK, great. Send me that. Well, we got a snail mail to you the payoff statement. OK, you got to wait a week to get the payoff statement in the mail. Well, now you can't still you still can't pay it off online. I got to go to the bank and do a wire transfer to route that money over. And the teller at the bank, I thought they were going to be excited. They, you know, they do these on occasion. Maybe there's a little a cupcake or something. No, this was just another transaction for her. So she's just like, what, what can I do for you? We're like, we'd like to pay off. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing a wire transfer. What's it for? Uh, we're, we're actually, we're paying off the house. Congratulations. That's the dream. It was like, oh my gosh, lady. Like, I don't know. She was, I don't know if she was having a bad day or what, but it was just such an anticlimactic experience. And even then the wire transfer takes like 24 hours. So she's like, it'll happen at some point today. Anything else I can do for you? No. And so I share all of that verbatim in the intro of the book because it was such a funny experience. And I wish people a more exciting mortgage payoff when they do it. Uh, but the fun part is, you know, getting to go on the Ramsey show a few months later and doing our debt free screen with Dave. And I was on the show with him that day. So I sneak from around the desk out to the lobby, join my wife and uh, we, we share our story and do our debt free screen. So that's that was the much more exciting moment that we needed. Awesome. You have now become a father. Talk about legacy and why going on this journey from broke, newly, uh, new job and American dream, American nightmare, start side hustling, you start grinding 18 months, then the mortgage, now seven figures, but, but legacy, man, that's such a powerful thing when you become a parent, when you start to realize, start thinking about changing your family tree, forget what was given to you. Now you start thinking about what you're about to pass on. Why is legacy, should legacy be a powerful motivator on this journey of breaking free from broke? Mm, that's beautifully said. Yeah, I, I, I end the book talking about generosity is joy and how giving is the most fun you can have with money in that legacy piece, because I think it's it's undervalued when you're young and you're single. You're just kind of looking out for you. You're, you know, you're trying to make it all work. But as you get married and you start having a family and having kids, it changed my paradigm. You know, three months ago when my daughter entered this world, it was just like, whoa. Number one, I turned from kind of, you know, cynical toward everything going on in the world to, oh, my gosh, God gave us this precious, pure, innocent gift that I get to raise. I have the burden and responsibility and joy of raising up to fight against all of the toxicity that's out there. So that that alone just adds a, a different layer to your goals, your motivation, what you want to do with your life. And on top of that, one of our goals was I want to raise my daughter in a debt free home, in a home that she's not going to see money fights and money stress. She's not going to ever have to worry about the burden of student loan debt that is plaguing 45 million Americans. Her college is going to be covered, and she's going to make the right choices when it comes to college. And she's going to learn that money comes from work. And she's going to learn that there's only three things you can do with money, give, save, and spend. And I want her to be a, a generous giver first and foremost. And I think that that kind of new chance, that new chance at life, to, all the mistakes we made you know, growing up, you want to help your kid avoid all of those and also know like they have to make the mistakes of their own. 
But like my friend Rachel Cruz, I mean, growing up as Dave Ramsey's daughter, there was so much blessing that she got to avoid. There is quote unquote privilege when you get to raise your kid in this environment where money stress is is a memory. And so that's such a beautiful uh, legacy piece for me of going, it's not about chasing a net worth anymore. It's how's my daughter's life going to be different because of the decisions we made? And what kind of person can she be when she's not inward focused, trying to worry about her own finances? Instead, she can look up and outward to go, how can I make kingdom impact? How can I do things that blow blow me away and impact my community impact this you know my my friends my family and so that's a very inspiring piece of this to where it goes beyond you know just a net worth goal and i i always joke that your net worth is not on your gravestone and uh that's not a piece of it it's gonna say that here's one date here's another date and that dash is all we have to make make an impact and uh as i joined fatherhood the fatherhood club it became like I want to be a good dad and good husband and getting control of my money early on just allows me to focus on that even more. That's so awesome, man. Let everybody know a little bit more about what they will find in your brand new book, Breaking Free from Broke and how they can get their copy. Absolutely. Uh, so this book was born out of me frustrated by this financial system that we all find ourselves in in this maze. And so the first two thirds of the book I unpack how the system is designed to keep us broke. And I do that with a lot of research, a lot of empathy. So I'm breaking down credit scores, credit cards, student loans, auto loans, mortgages, investing traps, marketing and consumerism. And after we break that down and you want to take a shower because of all the ick, and I show you how to live without a credit score and why you should ditch the credit cards and why you don't need to be a student with a student loan and you don't need to have a car payment. All of that leads to how to break free from this toxic system. And so I show people, hey, budgeting is freedom. It's not restrictive. You know, margin is breathing room. Spending is self-control. Wealth is patience. Generosity is joy. And all of that leads us to really getting to a choice where we get to decide, do we want to choose cynicism for another day or are we going to choose hope? Are we going to choose a different way of thinking, a different way of believing and acting? And so this is my version of the Total Money Makeover. Dave Ramsey called it financial peace for the next generation. And I try to do this all with tons of empathy, research, and humor to deliver it in such a way that is just so fresh, whether you're, you know, been a Ramsey listener for 30 years or you're brand new to money and you just want to learn. This is everything I wish I knew about money growing up, but never did or learned the wrong way. So I'm excited about this book. You can get it at RamseySolutions.com slash store. And we've got the audio book that's enhanced, the ebook, all kinds of goodies if you get it on presale before January 16th. And you did do a fantastic job with the book. I highly recommend it. George knows his stuff, and he has a, a great way in which he delivers the content. Before we go, George, there may be one person on the fence heard your story, and they're like, man, that, that's cool, and that's good for George and his wife and now his new baby, but these are my circumstances. These are the things that I'm facing. These are my variables, and I'm not sure if I can make this my reality. If you had a chance to talk to that person, what would you say to them? Mm. Well, there are situations where people go, that's great, but that's not that's not on the cards for me. And first of all, I, I just want to hug those people because I remember feeling like that. But the day that things changed for me when I kind of opted out of that was the day I realized I'm not special. And that's a beautiful thing, right? We're all unique and you know, uniquely crafted by the creator and all of that. But as far as our financial circumstances, you know, we get calls all the time where people go, listen, I'm going to do it this way and my plan because my situation is different. But I'm telling you, this is a proven plan done by 10 million people. And if you will just let go of the baggage, the shame, the guilt, the pride, the fear, all of that, and just submit yourself to this proven plan, just try it. Just 90 days of getting on the budget and paying attention to your money. 90 days of just trying to get a little bit of money stacked up in that starter emergency fund and trying to attack that debt. There's something that changes when you can just commit to a proven plan, have other people coaching you, cheering you on, and you have, you have it laid out for you. So many people, they just don't know what to do because there's a thousand options out there and a thousand voices. And so what I love about these baby steps is it works every time you work it regardless of where you came from. And there's situations where it's going to be harder. It's going to take longer. I don't want to minimize that. 
some people are are stuck in generational cycles of debt and poor money decisions and trauma and abuse and it's harder for those people that's correct but i still think it's possible because i meet them in the lobby and they share their stories of what they've been through and all it does it gives them an even better testimony because that everyone loves the underdog everyone loves the overcomer and those are the people i get to interact with every day and so that's why i have such positivity and faith that it's possible um and that's what we do every day on the ramsey show is we just try to deliver a little bit of hope over three hours to tell people it's possible for you you just got to take the right next step george can't say thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and share your story and your wisdom with us today thank you it's an honor thanks for having me there you have it ladies and gentlemen another edition of the his and her money show is in the books speaking of books George's brand new book, Breaking Free from Broke. Get it. Telling you, you will absolutely, positively enjoy it. We have a link to it in the show notes of this episode. Click it and get your copy today. Remember, we do this work not so that you can feel better, but so you can do better. So now the ball is in your court. Take what you learned today from George's story. Get his book. Dive even further into it and then do the work. That's all we got for this time, guys. It's been great. Until next time, peace.